Hi everyone, um, my name is uh, Ofri, here with me is uh, JJ, and um, we really appreciate you joining our session. We are very excited to, well, vir virtually be here with you today. Uh, never quite get used to this. Um, we're going to share the details of an exploit we, de we developed for remote controls uh, named Juarez the Remote. Um, it's a little bit technical, but we promise to do our best to make it as painless as possible. Um, maybe a few words about us before we begin. Uh, we come from Gardicore Labs, the research arm of Gardicore, uh, which is a segmentation company that's disrupting the legacy firewall market. Um, so not all of our research is directly related to firewalls, though. Um, our work also includes the discovery of uh, maybe you heard about the Fritz Frog peer-to-peer uh, -peer botnet we discovered. Uh, we rele released the Infection Monkey tool and uh, and and more. Um, you can uh, read all about this uh, in our blog. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's get started. Um, okay, so we we are going to be talking about the XR11 voice remote, which typically comes with the Comcast. A X1 cable box. And these are both very common items. Our listeners in the US have probably run into these before. And these remotes are very, very widespread. At 2017, there were, I think, more than 18 million of these uh, out there, which basically means they are one of the most common TV remotes in the world, probably. Um, now, the X XR11 is a normal TV remote with um, an extra functionality that allows you to give voice commands into the remote. So you press a blue button on the remote, say, mm, I want to see the, the cooking channel, and, and the TV does that. Um, now, most TV remotes communicate with the TV using IR frequency, infrared. Um, and IR is a short range mode of communication uh, that requires direct line of sight with the television. Now, this remote, this specific remote, uses RF frequencies, radio frequencies, which can cover much larger uh, distances. And it doesn't require line of sight. Now, the combination of a microphone in the remote with the reduction of the line of sight limitation, or in other words, the much longer distance a, a communication option is very interesting from a security perspective. I mean, what if we turn this into actually a listening device? The RF means we could pull off an attack from a distance, and the voice control is something we could abuse to record audio for anyone near the remote. But maybe the question uh, that uh, now comes to come up to mind is, how do we actually hack a remote? When you go about hacking something like this, the most obvious thing to do is to just break it open and see what's inside. It's usually the fastest way to get a big picture look at whatever you're working with. Um, if you take a close look at the circuit here, you might not identify a ton of stuff, but basically what you're looking at is a very simple computer. There's a little processor um, there's a keyboard that's connected off on the right, and there's a little light bulb here. Um, so like on this remote, when you hit the record button, um, uh, for voice commands, it, that little LED lights up in blue. Other buttons will make it go green or red. Um, and just by looking at the open board, you can get a basic idea of how these things are interconnected. And this is important to us because one of the first questions we have to ask ourselves if we wanna hack the microphone is whether the microphone is physically connected to the keyboard, um, right? If mechanically pressing the record button turns on the microphone, that is that there's a circuit breaker um, between the keyboard, between the microphone button and the LED, then there won't be any way to hack the microphone, right? There won't be any electricity to it un unless anyone is physically holding the button. Um, but if you actually follow the, the wiring on this board, you can see that the microphone isn't directly connected to the keyboard. Um, it connects to the processor, which is very good news as far as we're concerned. 
because that means that the processor, the little computer inside is in charge of telling the microphone when to record and when not to. So from our point of view, if we can control the processor, we should be able to take over the microphone. Um, so just by breaking this open, we got the answer to our very first question. Um, now that we know that the microphone is controlled by the processor, we need to figure out how to take control of the processor though. Um, if you take a close look at the processor chip here, you can see that the model number on it, um, it indicates you know, which make this is. In our case, it's a CC2530 chip, which is manufactured by Texas Instruments. Um, if you check out Texas Instruments website, you can read up on the CC2530 from its data sheet, uh, which indicates that this chip is useful for all sorts of low power IoT type applications. They even mention remote control systems. Um, they also mention that they have code samples. Um, they have code samples on the Texas Instruments site for people interested in developing their own remote control applications um, instead of you know, needing to write them from the ground up. Um, these samples are fantastic as far as we're concerned because they can help us get our bearings when we start reverse engineering the firmware on our remote. Um, it's more than likely that the remote's firmware will be at least partially based on these code samples. The samples actually recommend you know, working off of them when you write your own remote control firmware. So that's great for us, um, which takes us to the firmware. Uh, the, the firmware is the remote's bare bones operating system. It tells, it's basically the entire software end of the remote. Um, you'll remember that the XR11 remote, it comes with an X1 cable box. The box, if you look around on the box, you'll find it has a copy of the remote's firmware just as a file. Um, which sounds like something we can work with. But if you actually look at the files, you'll see it's about it's 124 kilobytes of pure binary, uh, you know, no, no, no strings, no symbols, just pure opcodes, pure 8051 architecture opcodes, um, which is basically a long list of instructions that tell the processor to behave at any given moment. So they're about 50,000 of these instructions, and that's way too many to go over by hand, you know, and try and uh, read the firmware one at a time. What we need is a foothold that will tell us where to start reverse engineering from. Now, to find that foothold, first we need to understand what's interesting to us within the firmware. We need to find the opcodes that will take us straight to the microphone because that's the part that we want to control. Um, which means that we need to find a bit of the firmware that is easy to identify and unique that we can associate uniquely with when you use the microphone. Um, we would love something that we can immediately you know, associate with that button press that turns on the microphone. But the problem is that code that manipulates the microphone itself will be pretty complicated to identify, right? Handling something like a peripheral device isn't that straightforward in terms of opcodes. So it'll be many hundreds of them. So it won't be something we can find that easily just by skimming through the firmware. Uh, but you'll remember when you hit the record button um, on the XR11 remote, the little blue, the little LED at the top lights up in blue, which is something that intuitively would be, you know, a lot simpler to uh, to identify than hand than turning on and off a microphone, right? Because turning on a light bulb is basically either sending electricity to it or not. So we're going to look for the sequence of opcodes that we can associate with turning the blue lead on or off. Um, you'll remember we mentioned earlier that Texas Instruments provides code samples to work off for people implementing their own remote controls. There's no sample that shows you how to manipulate a microphone, but there is one that shows how you could turn a lead on or off using the CC2530 chip, which is exactly what we're looking for. Uh, the sample, it's basically a long list of functions uh, and if you read through them, you'll find one of them is named 
Hal led on off, which, you know, led on off sounds basically like what we're looking for, a function that will make the lead light up in blue somehow. Um, and the way the Hal led on off code works in the sample is that it, it assumes that the lead is directly connected to four of the pins on the processor. Right? If you look at the processor chip, it's just a little square with many legs sticking out in every direction. Um, and each of these legs is connected to a, different, to a different piece of hardware all over the remote circuit board. Uh, the sample um, points to four of those legs in particular, named P11, P12, P13, P14. And it just sets the electricity to those legs on or off, depending on the colors you want, uh, or sets them to one or zero. Uh, that's all the functionality that they need to control the LEDs in the code sample. So that's pretty straightforward, and it should be pretty unique as well, right? Besides manipulating the LEDs, nothing else should be accessing these four pins. So in theory, we know what the firmware code that performs HAL LED on off would look like. Um, so once we can ident once we identify where HAL LED on off is based on the code that based on the op codes that manipulate these four legs, um, we can find the actual use of HAL LED on off that's interesting to us. So HAL LED on off is a function that takes two parameters. It takes one that says which LEDs you want to manipulate and another that says whether you want to turn those LEDs on or off. Um, so we're looking for the following sequence of op codes. We want to first to store the first parameter and that says that we want the bulb to be on, which is zero one as opposed to zero zero. The second parameter we're looking for specifies the color of the LED that we're turning on. And after that, after we store the first and second parameters, we want to jump to the part of the code that runs HALED on off itself. Now, since we could identify HALED on off, um, we were able to spot code that performs a jump to this address pretty readily. Um, once we found all the locations that jump to HALED on off, we, had, we have to figure out which one of them was the one that that is associated with the microphone. And if you look through all of the sequences of op codes that do this, only one of them uses color number four, right? There's also color one and two and three. And the LED on the remote can light up in blue, red, green, or yellow. So it's not immediately obvious which color this represents, but by combing the manual and playing around with the remote, uh, we determined that unlike the other colors, red, green, and yellow, there's only one way to turn the LED blue, and that's by hitting the record button. So it stands to reason that if color number four shows up in one place exactly, that color would be blue. In other words, this is the location we're looking for. Um, and once we started from that location of turning on the blue LED, we poked around nearby and we actually found code that looks like um, microphone initialization code. Uh, it happens shortly before the blue LED is switched on. There's a sequence of op codes that, that manipulates the microphone. And our question was whether there was any other way to trigger the microphone code um, other than pressing the recording button. Right, because we, for our attack, we want to turn the microphone on without requiring someone to physically be there and hold the button. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really look like there was any other way to do this. Other than pressing the button, no other code flows led to the part of the firmware that, that started up the microphone. Um, so we need to find another way to trigger the microphone. So how can we do this? Well, what if we could entirely change the remote's operating system? Um, back in 2017, a bunch of researchers from Bastille Networks actually did some work on the XR11 remotes, the ones we're looking at. And they discovered that these remotes receive firmware upgrades from the X1 cable boxes over the air. Um, 
which is pretty cool, right? That's pretty advanced functionality for a TV remote to get firmware upgrades. Um, and the Bastille guys proved that the remote uh, will, act, will accept an unsigned firmware image uh, from the box it's paired with. Besides a, a very simple uh, cyclic redundancy check, there was no cryptographic validation done on the firmware at all, um, which means that you could theoretically edit the firmware somehow and then send an up, a firmware upgrade to the remote from the box it's paired with. They, they took advantage of this to push their own uh, you know, identical firmware version where they just changed the... Uh, the version number to 1337, you can see it over here. Uh, this is a screenshot from their slide. Um, and at the end of their lecture, it was in uh, DEF CON, uh, Logan Lamb from their presentation said this, he said, we thought it would be really cool if we could push an over the air update to this remote and make the remote a listening device. We haven't got that far yet. You guys should do it, which is exactly where our research comes in. Um, so our work is basically cut out for us. First, we need to find a way to attack the firmware up upgrade mechanism, and then we'll take advantage of that to push our own malicious firmware image to the remote. Uh, we'll have to write that malicious firmware image ourselves. Uh, once we do that, we should be able to control the microphone from afar. Uh, but first, we'll need an idea of how firmware upgrades actually work for the remote. So each remote is paired to one box, um, and the box that it's paired with is the one that gets asked for new firmware images. Once a day, the remote asks the box whether it has a new firmware image for it. Uh, in reality, Comcast basically never releases upgrades for, this for these remotes. There's no reason to. So 99% of the time, the box says, no, there's no firmware image. And that's the end of that until the next day. Um, but if the box tells the remote, yes, I have a new firmware image for you, then the remote will start asking for that firmware image one chunk at a time. Say first, send me the first X bytes at position whatever, and then the next Y bytes at the next position. And it goes through the whole firmware image uh, until it has the entire file. So this is, uh, it takes about 1500 chunks. Uh, it takes a little while. Um, we would love to push our own firmware to the remote using this mechanism, but we don't control the box. So we can't just take over the box and tell it to use our own firmware image um, because we, we don't have a way to hack the box from afar. But if the remote only accepts firmware images from the box it's paired with and we can't take over the box, our only way in is to pretend to be the box. We want to impersonate the box that the remote trusts and asks for firmware images. Uh, there are two main problems with this approach. First, there's the question of interference. When the remote asks for new firmware, if I, if I could just answer it, yes, there's new firmware for you with so-and-so firmware, and at the same time, the box says, no, there is no firmware image, we're gonna be in a race with the box. And as often as not, we're going to lose that race. Um, so we need to find a way to get the box out of the way when we're impersonating it. The second and more fundamental issue is that you can't simply tell the remote anything you like. Communication between the remote and the box is encrypted. Uh, outsiders can't just push their messages in the middle unless they, were, they share the secret between the remote and the box. So let's, uh, first, let's solve the easier problem of the two. How do we overcome the interference issue? There's a process on the box. The box just runs uh, Linux and there's a process on it that interacts with the remote and it's called control manager. Uh, we were looking for uh, denial of service candidates. You know, we just need a way to, to get control manager out of the way for us for a bit. Um, so we tried the simplest thing you can imagine. Uh, which we wrote a very simple fuzzing implementation, which basically generates random packets and sends them to, to the control manager process. Uh, you know, so, so usually it takes a little while for, for uh, 
fuzzers like this to actually find anything of interest, but within like five seconds, we had control, we had crash con control manager. Um, so didn't take very much to, uh, to get that out of the way. Um, control manager starts back up after you crash it uh, a few seconds later, uh, but that's all we need. We just needed to miss one specific packet, which is the one where it tells the remote, there's no firmware image available for you. The other issue uh, with the, the, the cryptography is much more problematic. Um, you'll remember there's a, ser a shared secret key between the XR11 remote and the X1 cable box. And that secret is coordinated between them at pairing time, uh, which is what basically when you uh, get the box for the first time and set it up in your home. And we're not around for this process, so we can't just snoop on the secret key. By the time we're around, all the communication is already encrypted, which means that we'll need a vulnerability if we're going to find a way in here. So we looked for one, and it actually didn't take that long to find. We found out that not everything that goes between the remote and the box is encrypted. When you're uh, holding the record button on the, on the remote, the audio packets that are sent are not encrypted, uh, which is interesting because that means that if we compare the unencrypted packets from the audio, for example, to the encrypted ones, which are from any other button press, you can find that each packet is marked with one bit that says whether the packet is secured or not. Um, there's a protocol uh, called RF4CE that specifies most of the communication between, between these two devices. And it mentions this secure bit um, where one means secure and zero means not secure. And, and in reality, what secure means is whether the packet's contents are encrypted or not, um, which is very interesting because it means that not the whole connection between the box and the remote is encrypted as you might expect, but rather it's it's on a per packet basis, um, whether or not that packet is encrypted. So that means that if you can send your own packet, your own packet and mark it as not secure or not encrypted, you can essentially inject your own packet into the session and the other side will just accept it as part of the protocol. It will just read that as a plain text packet if you don't mark it as encrypted. So, uh, to recap that, the remote doesn't verify that the packet actually came from the box. It will just accept the packet, whether it's encrypted or not. So if we can send our own packets that look like they're coming from the box and mark them as not encrypted, the remote should accept them. Um, and now this would be perfect if we could just tell the remote, do a firmware upgrade, um, right? Because if we could just create that plain text packet, and the remote would accept it, we've, we've won. Uh, but as it turns out, you can't simply initiate a session with the remote. The remote's operating system is built so that it is always the initiating side of the transaction. Um, basically, it's not, it doesn't listen around for commands. It doesn't wait around listening for commands. It is always the first one to send out a query, uh, which is basically a, a, a neat way for it to conserve battery because it means that it doesn't have to have its RF transceiver around all the time. From our perspective, what that means is we can't tell actively tell the remote start take a firmware upgrade from us. We have to wait for it to ask for that firmware upgrade before we can respond to it and say, yes, there is an upgrade available. Um, but the problem with this is that everything the remote sends out is encrypted. So even if we can send out plain text packets, we can't decipher what the remote is asking for in the first place. So how can we know what to answer? What we need to do is guess. Um, we were looking for a way to make the remote accept our firmware. Uh, if we can guess that the remote is asking for a new firmware image, and which chunks it's asking for each time of that firmware image, we don't actually have to decrypt those packets. We can just pretend we understand what it's asking for and send back our response. Um, it's a little bit like how in real life you don't have to listen that closely to uh, the other half of the conversation if you know what to answer. Um, so what our final process will look like is something like this. Although the daily firmware upgrade request from the remote is encrypted, 
Um, thanks to a little giveaway parts in the, of the of that request packet, we can understand whether that is the remote asking for a new firmware image or not. So once we know that we have a, a new firmware request packet on hand, what we need to do is we need to crash the remote. We need to, uh, to crash the box, the control manager process we talked about earlier, just to get it out of the way for a few seconds. So we send our malicious packet over RF to the box and then control manager is gone. Next, we need we identify the request for the new firmware image and answer that yes, we have a new firmware image available. Next, the remote will ask for the first chunk. This request is encrypted. Um, the box ignores that request because control manager was crashed when the remote asked for it. But we see the requests and we can guess that the remote is asking for the first chunk. And the, for the following firmware chunks, the order is, is very predictable, which means that each time the remote asks for a chunk using an encrypted request for send me the first or second or third chunk or whatever, we can just guess exactly which one it's asking for and send that back in a non-encrypted packet which means that piece by piece, we can send the whole firmware image that we choose. And once we've completed the whole process from the beginning to the, the whole 1500 packets, the remote will restart with the new firmware image running. Now, to do all of this, we need some equipment. Uh, not everyone has an RF transceiver on hand at home. Luckily, we had one that we had bought a long time ago. But it's not at all expensive to do this. I mean, the antenna we used here is pretty powerful and it costs about $30 and there are much cheaper ones than that. Uh, like the one connected to my computer here, which costs about a dollar. So it's not that difficult to turn your computer into an RF hacking device. We implemented a little script that does just the process I just described, which is guessing each time which chunk of the firmware the remote is asking for and sending that chunk. Um, first, we tried to, re to replace the remote's firmware with the same exact firmware it's already using. Uh, th this is what that looks like. Uh, here you can see the remote is flashing yellow, meaning I'm getting new firmware chunks. And at the very end, there's a little green LED and that's success. The remote is restarted with the firmware we pushed, which is exactly the same one it had to start with. Um, so once we've sent all 1500 packets of the, we had all those little yellow blinks, we have taken over the remote control. Next, we tried to write our own, to make our own little change to the firmware to test that's working just right. We changed the little 04 from the record uh, LED, you'll remember earlier, that made it light up in blue. And we changed it to, to a 02 to make it a green LED instead. Uh, so just by changing that one little bit in the entire firmware image, uh, we, we wanted to see if we could you know, make our own changes and that they would get uploaded to the remote and they would work. Um, so, uh, we, we ran our script again with the new image and when we press the, um, the record button now, you can see it lights up in green and at the very beginning there, it was green before it flashed blue. So that is super exciting, right? It means that we have our first part of the attack in hand. We, we can actually push an arbitrary firmware image to it. Now, the, having the blue LED is pretty cool, but uh, changing it to green is pretty cool, but it's not quite evil enough. We want something a little more evil. We want to take over the microphone. Um, so we have to um, actually write that malicious firmware image that will take over the microphone. Let's, let's get to that. So adding your own functionality to firmware is not that simple. You can't just glue in the middle anything you would like because a lot of code refers to other code addresses in all sorts of complicated ways. It's kind of like if you tried to add a paragraph to the middle of a book, right? You'd completely break the table of contents. So writing firmware is the same in a lot of ways, um, except that if you modify the firmware in a way that breaks it, you will ruin your remote. It'll never boot up again. It will become a worthless piece of junk. And we didn't have an endless supply of TV remotes on hand, so we weren't that interested in doing it the hard way. 
Um, and basically, the, the best way to avoid doing anything too harmful to the remote is to make as tiny a modification as you can to reach your goal, basically the shortest path to changing it. Uh, we want the remote to start recording when it receives a command from the outside, right? So um, the firmware upgrade normally happens once every 24 hours. And what we did is we made a tiny change that makes it check once a minute instead. So, so far, no big changes. Um, now, normally, uh, the remote would ask, you know, is there a new firmware image or not? And the box would say, yes, I, knew, I do, or no, I don't. Um, and we added a tiny change that makes it understand a new, a third response to that question. Uh, it now understands a new answer that says, please start recording now. Um, and we, we, may, we sort of rewired the remote's firmware to jump to the recording code from before when it sees that response. Um, so in the original firmware, the only way to reach the microphone code was when the record button is pressed, and we made it so that it will go there when you give it the magic answer of start, start recording. And when the remote sees that, it just starts recording for 10 minutes at a time as if you were holding the button. It starts recording and transmits all of the recorded stuff over RF because that's normally what it does when you hit the record button. All of these changes were made by modifying just 36 bytes of the firmware file out of you know, more than 100 kilobytes. So that's a really tiny modification. Um, so once the remote is running our new firmware, the, the new flow becomes available, which is once every minute, the remote asks the box for new firmware, uh, same request every minute instead of just once every 24 hours. When the attacker decides to start recording, they temporarily crash the box. Um, the remote will ask for a new firmware image. The box will not respond as before. And the attacker, instead of responding, yes, new firmware image or no, it will, the attacker will respond, please start recording. And once the remote sees that, it jumps to the recording code and you have 10, minute, 10 minutes of a live audio stream. Once it's done with that stream, we can repeat it as often as we like because the remote's just gonna keep asking for new firmware upgrade. Okay, so now that we have both a vulnerability and a malicious firmware, it's time to actually run the attack. And um, so we went outside to do some field tests. And we found that the attack varied depending on the distance and obstruction from the remote. But uh, uh, we're able to pretty reliably pull it off from about uh, 65 feet through a solid wall, uh, attacking from the outside of, uh, of an apartment. And that when we used pretty inexpensive equipment, uh, as mentioned before. So I would guess that with a better gear, we could definitely have pulled this off from a much longer distance. Now, for the initial attack, you have to wait around uh, for a while. Uh, so the remote uh, daily firmware upgrade check uh, will, will kick in. Uh, and once you've caught that, it takes another 20 to 30 minutes to upload our malicious firmware to the remote. Now, once that's done, you can actually start recording at any point that you like. So since the remote asks any, I think every a minute or so whether uh, to start recording. So basically we ended up with something as if taken from a spy move, uh, sitting in a van and uh, uh, listening to what's happening in the apartment next to us. Now, the question is, does the recording from such a device sound any good? Like, from how far does the remote's microphone hear its surroundings? So we actually took us a while uh, uh, to figure out how to even decode the audio coming from this remote. And uh, once we did that, we were pleased to find that the remote's tiny microphone is really surprisingly strong. And you can hear pretty clearly a conversation from around 15 feet from the remote, which was very impressive. And, and we were kind of surprised uh, by these results. Um, so we could hear a, a, a conversation 50 feet from the remote inside uh, the apartment. Now here is a quick recording we made from this distance. So you can hear this very clearly considering it is a tiny micro microphone in a remote control. Now, that's pretty much it. 
for the technical details. And at this point, we realized that we should probably get in touch with Comcast uh, reporting about um, what, what we, we discovered. So we wrote to them about our findings. They got back to us right away. Um, within a couple of months, they released a number of fixes. They fixed the issue that allowed third-party firmware to be installed on the remote by signing firmware cryptographically. Uh, they fixed the bug that allowed us to reply to the remote with unencrypted packets. And last, they fixed the bug on the box that allowed us to crash it, which makes it harder to pull off this attack without the box interfering. And um, so to recap, here is what we have. First, there is the fact that you can turn a remote into a listening device. And um, one of the things that enabled this is how much the remote relies on RF for its communication. It's surprising enough that the TV remote has firmware upgrades, but the fact that it pushes them over the air or over RF it really struck us. This was a much heavier use of RF than we would expect it for a widespread home device such as a, a TV remote. If devices like these start relying more heavily on RF for their system upgrades and administration, it's likely more and more threats will come from this direction, especially since RF interferences haven't been that very heavily audited up until now. It's, it's hard to say how many other devices are built on top of remote TI, the development kit that the XR11 remote firmware is based on. Pretty much anything using this will be proprietary and hard to find without reverse engineering. But assuming Comcast isn't the only company using this kit, it's likely that the crypto flu, uh, flow we, we took advantage of here will turn up in other devices too. Finally, we should stress how important it is to fix disclosed security issues, even if they don't seem easily exploitable uh, at first glance. Um, I want to take a small step back, uh, undoubtedly, uh, uh, all of you have heard about IoT research in some degree by now. Uh, uh, it feels like once a week someone takes over Alexa or something. Uh, what we believe is interesting about this particular project is that remote control is pretty standard household device. Not many people would think of it as an IoT. Even privately con conscious people, conscious people, which I hope is most of us, don't think a remote control is being something that is potentially attackable at all. We weren't able to find anything really about attacks on TV remotes. And we assume that because people don't think they are viable targets uh, or valuable one, uh, but they are uh, because of all this new functionality comes in like the voice control, which means they have a microphone and RF transition over long distances. Everyone heard that IOT is everywhere and can be easily exploited, but the stuff that hurt the most are the devices or any parts of life that we least expecting it. Um, so the good news is that this attack shouldn't work anymore. Comcast patch version 1.1.4 mitigates all issues, talked about it. Uh, as for future, RF isn't exactly a new technology, but from a security perspective, research has remained pretty sparse on RF-based attack vectors as far as smart devices are concerned. As these devices become more sophisticated, we will see more critical communication over RF, which means we will probably run into new threats in all sorts of RF tech, whether it is smart home stuff or more industrial devices. If there is anything we can be sure is cybersecurity, uh, it's that when first few exploits show up somewhere, a lot more will follow. So stuff that used to be reserved for nation state actors like the smart TV hacks from Snowden's leaks never leave cybercrime far in its wake. And if that's not enough, the world of work from home means that the exposure to threats like these uh, uh, home devices reaches all the way to enterprises now. And uh, when there isn't clear separation of high or low clearance, and when every employee's home is effectively an office space, uh, threats to privacy like a malicious listening device are now potentially threats to trade secrets as well. And security con conscious organization that wouldn't allow an Alexa in a conference room can hardly expect an employee working from home to take his TV remote out of the room. So summing up, if you want to read more about our research, you are welcome to visit the article website and download the full research report. Thank you all for listening.